Hi everyone, my name is Dillemijn from uh, CPA. I will be your moderator for this webinar. Thank you all very much for joining us during this webinar on uh, this Are You In Control? Transfer Pricing and Control Assessment. I will first introduce the speakers of today, which are uh, Raymond Gerardu, our uh, Chief Commercial Officer of TPA, and he has over 25 years of experience in the tax and transfer pricing field performed and performed roles in both advisory and industry. Uh, also, we have Igna Valutite. She's uh, an associate here, and she's a transfer pricing specialist with experience in transfer pricing, risk management, and performance improvement. And then also myself, I'm a junior associate here at CPA. I will also um, tell you some uh, ground rules. Uh, we will re be recording this webinar and the presentation, and they will be available on, on our website, www tpaglobal.com uh, in about a week, and uh, we will send, send you an email when the materials are available to download. And if you have any questions, you are free to do that throughout the uh, presentation. You can either type your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A, and we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So now I will give the word to Raymond. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, we go to the content slide of our presentation. What are we going to talk about? Basically, what we want to convey to you is that tax, and many of you know this, so it might be an open door, it's not just anymore a technical topic managed by tax technical people. It has become a board issue, as many of you know, and basically what is the tax governance all about? It's about making sure uh, that the board feels it has all the proper information and control over the tax function and it issues, and that you know the organization operates along those lines. I can give you a, a, a short example, which may come back at a later stage in the presentation, um, to, to just give you a bit of a flavor. If, if you consider a food company that is trying to reduce its tax expense line to the limit, and you may want to consider that that company is operating God knows how many countries where people in those countries eat their product. If you ask yourself the question, what happens to the public opinion if the public starts to understand that this food company who feeds them is not paying a lot of taxes in their country? The experience tells us that we have seen cases where public hearings took place where these companies need to basically justify what they were doing from a public morality perspective. That's what we're talking about, and this is how you know, boards in these days are actually looking at the tax function. Uh, it's not just anymore about reducing cost in the tax line. Igne, can you take um, the, the next part, please? Uh, thank you, Raymond. Yes, so to, to actually help uh, uh, companies to tackle tax transfer pricing uh, governance uh, uh, challenges, uh, TPA has developed a transfer pricing and control assessment, uh, which uh, uh, evaluates uh, transfer pricing performance uh, or transfer pricing function performance. Uh, that it helps to identify performance gaps and also develops an action plan on how to close those gaps. So I will briefly explain how this type of assessment works in practice. William and will also join me and, and will guide you through the live demonstration of our methodology and, and, and type of questions we are asking. Uh, and finally, you will find out uh, uh, more about the potential benefits of applying this type of assessment. Okay. Yeah, we can continue. Yep. Um, just as a quick practical note, if there's anybody having questions, you can ask those questions in the interim or at the end. I think that's fine. Uh, we will see that uh, coming through the chat. If you can please ask your questions through the chat, and we will try to pick them up as we, uh, as, as we, um, we go on. Okay. On this slide, which is uh, talking about uh, tax governments and transfer pricing governments, the way we look at this is that there are three elements, control, goals, communication. We put them in a triangle. You can put them in a circle. What it means is 
if a company has goals and a, and a strategy set out, how does it control it? You know, detective controls, proactive controls, uh, and how does it communicate it? It is essential that all these things align with each other. I, I think it's, for many of you, probably an open door, but in practice what we see is it is not always that easy to do this in practice. Uh, governance is basically a, a set of relationships where, you know, the, the board, its management, but also outside stakeholders and internally are fully aligned, are aware of each other's goals and targets, and basically communicate back and forth in a very transparent way. So transparency is becoming a very important aspect as well. And we see that, for instance, coming through the way that you know OECD is looking at CBC, where it wants to get transparent reporting. So the challenges increase, obviously, with more transparency. Uh, but that's where you know the world is uh, trending toward. Next slide, please. If we look at uh, the page with you know a couple of stakeholders, we just wanted to give you an illustration. And by no means is this the only list of, of, of expectations that people may have or stakeholders may have. It's a list of, you know, what do shareholders uh, slash investors like? They have an expectation of net profit, but they could also have uh, an expectation that you are, you know, socially responsible. So coming back to the food company, you might also have shareholders who invest in companies that have a social responsibility and they can evidence that social responsibility. I just have to, to mention green policies and, and publicizing and also measuring those green policies is important. So for the food company, yeah, some investors will say, I'm just interested in net profit, but others will say that they also have to be responsible in sharing in tax expense uh, in that country. Um, how does it line up with the tax responsibility of of the organization itself. If you have shareholders that are really communicating, I want net profit is obviously to optimize the tax position. Analysts, banks, you know, people that have a, a, a view of the company that provide maybe loans to the company that want to share information with the market, they are looking at transparency. Uh, in that instance, they are looking at effective tax rate, tax cash, but also about risks and a fair assessment of risk. Tax authorities, uh, they obviously have a different view of the world. Again, you know, they're looking at, you know, how can they limit their own cost on the audits, but at the same time get their fair share from the company in, in the tax line. The supervisory uh, authority, which is the supervisory, uh, you know, if you're looking at the, um, the regulatory authorities for banks or, or for insurance companies, you know, they have also, again, other requirements that they want to see met. Uh, the audit committee, which is the internal audit committee of your board, supervisory board, management board, reputation is an issue. No tax surprises could be an issue. How can you deal with that? Your tax department needs to be organized in a such a way that can transparently uh, share information on all these topics and have a very collaborative approach around how to deal with these issues, what to do at what point in time. Your external auditors, to say the least, are people that also come with a, with a different view of the world and, and checking up on you, what you've done. Uh, and then we have the public society fair share. We talked about it before. It's just a picture, and no doubt each and every one of you can have uh, a different picture for your company with different stakeholders. What we're trying to share with you is if you want to manage in a proper way your tax function, the very strong recommendation would be to ensure that you have mapped out all your stakeholders very clearly, that you may even want to interview your stakeholders to understand what they actually expect of you, and then last but not least that you put in motion a plan that works in order to meet all these requirements in terms of how you communicate with them and what you effectively implement. To take the next slide, again, this corporate responsibility is just an example. It's, you know, what we said before, financial reporting alone is not the only thing anymore in the world. Um, it also has 
become a sort of ethical discussion around values that we do not typically measure uh, if we're talking about the effective tax rate and the cash taxes and the risk associated. Many companies have uh, tax planning ideas implemented that if you strictly look at the legal uh, setting, it's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong about it. Um, but it starts to become, for tax authorities, maybe aggressive. This has led us to the whole discussion around aggressive tax planning. OECD is chasing those kind of, you know, ruling practices, APA practices that we may see still legally very well embedded, but, you know, the, the blurred line, as we call it, between the acceptable and unacceptable planning ideas is, is, yeah, is existing, and you need to find a fine-tuned way on how you manage that. If you still consider more aggressive style versus what maybe the tax authorities or the public opinion looks at, you also need to make sure that you have an answer to the question why you're doing that which means that you have a public relation debate to be prepared for. That's what I mean also by how do you governance the tax function. It's not just doing it and taking a, a conscious decision of risk, but you should also be able to, to answer to the questions when it's get challenged. Um, there's obviously a, um, a fine line between the, 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 the legal and illegal tax planning. Everybody knows it. Don't cross the border is a clear recommendation. Um, and that's probably where we should not even be going as an organization because it's very hard, if not impossible, to, to justify. Um, let's go to the next slide. Igna, do you want to take um, the next one? Yes. yes. So uh, this uh, slide uh, illustrates the standard example of uh, how comp companies manage their tax bills. And uh, I'm not going to dig very deep into the uh, technicalities of these type of structures, but I just want to highlight the fact that by applying these structures, in this case, uh, IP rights structure to hybrid entities, companies are able to push their residual profits to uh, countries where there is no tax rate uh, uh, applied. In this case, Bermuda example, where we have 0% tax rate on, on income and capital gains. Um, so uh, it looks quite complicated uh, if you look in, into this slide and you see various intercompany transactions in place. But actually, it is all consistent uh, with the arm's length principle. And also, it is compliant with the tax laws of uh, various uh, countries involved. Um, so in, in this uh, case, you might ask, so what is all the fuss about and uh, why everyone is discussing that and uh, why we also pointing out to this? example, uh, well, uh, companies, uh, by applying this type of structures, they um, are able to significantly reduce the tax bills, and, and uh, it is obvious that uh, some uh, tax authorities are not very happy about these type of arrangements. And actually, we can also go back to the uh, uh, food company example that Raymond was talking about. And then uh, uh, let's uh, assume that your favorite food company is, uh, is able to earn solid profits in a particular country, in your country, but you also are aware that uh, uh, they pay no or less taxes they, they, that they should be paying in, in, in your country. So what would be your reaction in this case? Um, so we are going back to the corporate social responsibility discussion. And actually, uh, it is currently under attack by BEPS, and it's also driven by public uh, society view on what is the right uh, or what is the correct tax bill, and also their perception uh, that companies should be paying their fair share of tax. Um, so taking these type of examples into account and all these type of discussions and looking forward, uh, communication around tax uh, will be an increasing area of focus for all companies. And companies, uh, they need to make sure that they have the right tools in place um, uh, to help uh, uh, or to, to uh, ensure proper communication uh, around tax and tax strategy and also ensure that they have the, uh, the right tax transpricing risk management process in place. And this leads us to the, to the second part of the presentation. We can move further. Okay, thank you, Igne. Um, yeah. 
I think it's a, the, the leakage example we mentioned. It's just one of many, and, and, and some of you know very well how these kind of structures technically work. Uh, they can be very, very legal, very well structured, and, and thus hard to attack by, by tax authorities. But at the same time, if you do choose such a, a, a structure, be ready to be questioned and answer questions. And that's, that's the message. So in the way we look at uh, the general tax or transfer pricing control framework is, uh, is shown on page number nine. There is obviously a couple of actors, a couple of activities that we, we try to bring together. It's the people. It's also the workflow, the processes that are being managed. What kind of software are we using? Are we efficient, yes or no? Um, and how do we report and what do we report? Um, in terms of, of people, it's about their performance, their, 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 their behavior uh, to a large extent. How do they communicate? Do they have the right knowledge? But that can be technical, but also, you know, can they communicate again in a, in, in a good way? Do we have the right people in place altogether? Um, the workflows, if we stick for a minute to transfer pricing, which is close to our heart in a way, we, we look at all sorts of processes. How do you make sure that you, at the minimum level, deliver from a compliance point of view? How do you align your information that you have with the financial data that you actually need to run such a report? Uh, what kind of software tools are you using? Are you using the software tools? How does your finance organization <clears throat> provide all the information that you need to be able to make judgment calls? How can you get the right information so that you can do the right reporting, be it to your board, be it to, to your senior management, be it to the outside world, be it to, uh, to, to the auditors? We will take a holistic view about how your organization is set up and we will go step by step through each and every one of them to figure out how we can look at what is it that you actually need to produce at the end and what are the building blocks that get you to be able to report at the end to whichever stakeholder and whatever information those stakeholders need. So by taking a, a look at your stakeholders' needs, you need to do sort of reverse engineering way of looking at all these elements that I just talked about very briefly on this page number nine. How do you align them to ensure that you can meet all these stakeholder requirements? Ignit, can we go quickly to 10? Yes, so, yeah. You want to start, Ignit, on 10? Yeah, okay. So, um, so as Raymond already mentioned, uh, the starting point for uh, organizing the structure of the in-house tax uh, function is to make a decision of, of what are the key focus areas and uh, we translated the transfer pricing uh, and tax governance framework into nine building blocks which we believe comprise a, a successful in-house transfer pricing function. And then these nine workloads are listed in, in this slide. Um, so if you for example, take documentation. Uh, organizations, of course, they need to make sure that uh, processes and procedures around transfer pricing information and documentation, they are well-defined within an organization and also they are implemented, so meaning that some quality uh, uh, control processes are in place as well. Of course, uh, they need to make sure that the documentation is updated regularly as well and, and, and not uh, outdated. Uh, if we take risk management, uh, another very important um, uh, building block, um, so organizations should make sure not even to ha not only to have a, a tax risk, transfer pricing risk uh, management process in place, but also to make sure that that uh, 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 risk management uh, framework is able to align the three realities being finance, legal, and economic um, systems. Uh, uh, the right IT infrastructure should be in place that uh, allows uh, companies to retrieve uh, transfer pricing relevant numerical as well as uh, uh, qualitative data. 
um, uh, so that there, there is no extensive manual intervention anymore uh, needed. Um, we also touch upon um, uh, uh, workloads such as consultancy, audit support, uh, global benchmarking plat platform, signal processes, legal agreements, etc. I don't know, Raymond, would you like to, to comment on, on, on those workflows? Sure. If you take the nine building blocks, what we typically do is we, we try to break those nine down into separate processes. It's really a granular approach of who does what, by when, and where do we report it to. So every Every block will be carved up in terms of almost if you, for some of you, you may know RACI, which has this, um, this, this RACI concept which comes out of the uh, control environment uh, audit. Uh, we try to look at who is responsible, who is accountable, who needs to be communicated towards and who needs to be informed. Um, this model we try to apply to each of these building blocks and start to assign those responsibilities and accountabilities to individuals in your organization. And we also try to assign the ultimate uh, deliverable that needs to come out of those action points, which will be a communication, whether it's a report, whether it's just a very simple update to your CFO, whatever it is, it always has to come up to a deliverable towards one of the goals that were set by the stakeholders' interviews. So it is quite a, I'm not going to say a painful exercise, but in a way it, it requires a, a, you know, a good and solid discussion with all the people that need to play a role in all these activities. And as you very well know, many of you know where the limitations are of the tax department and where suddenly the requirements are pushed upon uh, maybe your finance organization or even the business, you need to find a way to negotiate those roles and responsibilities together with those departments in ensuring that you can actually do your job in today's world. It has become a pretty complex matrix type of responsibility and you need to stand up and, and make sure that tax can deliver against all these uh, all these requirements. So that's what we, in a nutshell, try to share with you on, on page 10. Um, how can we go about looking at organizations in assessing maybe how they, uh, how they measure up against these kind of uh, nine building blocks, if you will? Um, and that's, I think, where, um, Igne, you can start looking at you know, the next slides in terms of the TP in control assessment and how it can work. Is that fine? Yes. Okay. So, uh, as it was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, TPA has developed a transfer pricing in control assessment that aims to uh, uh, help you to evaluate the performance of, of, of your transfer pricing function and also uh, helps to define an in-control statement on, on, on your transfer pricing processes and very briefly how this type of assessment works in practice. So on one side we have uh, these nine workloads and rating. Um, so as was already mentioned by, by Raymond, uh, these nine building blocks, they further open up into 45 components, um, in other words, questions. And each question is assessed and uh, described as a series of behaviors uh, on a scale of one to five, uh, one meaning that it's uh, a basic level of performance uh, ad hoc or no practices or processes are applied, uh, to five, or five meaning that uh, uh, this is a leading practice, state of the art practices and processes are in place. Um, so this type of analysis uh, helps to get the as this picture of a company or of your transpiring function and and. Uh, it is important to mention that we also ask uh, uh, companies to indicate their desired future uh, maturity levels, and uh, this approach uh, allows us to better understand how to actually bridge the gap between the current practice and the, the desired level, and also uh, develop an action plan. So this is in a nutshell also how, how this works in practice, and, and now Willemine will demonstrate to you um, how this, uh, this assessment uh, looks like practically. 
Thanks, Sikna. This is our uh, assessment. I'm here already uh, in our questions uh, tab, as you can see, the TP maturity assessment. Uh, on the left side, you will see which workflow it is, which is now we're at development. Then each workflow has five sub-workflows which, with five corresponding questions. So, for example, for documentation, we have quick scan. And then the question is, how often is information sourced to assess the effectiveness of the data included in the file? Then we also have uh, processing and documenting TP information with a question that relates to the work workflow. Uh, define uh, a workflow on the transfer pricing methods used for price setting and price checking. Uh, a quality control for the final delivery of TP, company, uh, TP documentation and conduct update of the global master file. I will um, then, per workflow, you, so you have a question, you have your as is status and your to be, this is your desired uh, status, and then you see we already have defined levels of answers for each level, so basic, developing, established, advanced, and leading, each already have their predefined answers. Now I will show you how it then exactly works. So I, I have two uh, examples for question one and two. So for example, company A, which is a corporate uh, corporate operate, operating in the financial services industry, it sources every five years for information to assess the effectiveness of data included in the TP documentation. Uh, this means that their as-is level is developing so in order to get there, you need to just push the buttons till you see, oh, sorry about this. We have a little technical problem. Sorry, guys. Well, at least this developing will be blue. And then, uh, however, the company A wants to source uh, information each year. That level is advanced, as you can see. So then you click again on the arrows until it goes to advanced. And then you'll see that this is orange. So the blue um, is corresponding to your as is status, and the orange corresponds to your desired uh, to be status. Then you the same for the second question. To what extent are procedures around to be information processing and documentation structured? So. Uh, another example, company A has the capability to document the inform TP information, but it did not clarify, uh, clearly specify which persons are responsible for doing so. This also comes back to the race metric experiment earlier talked about. Um, you can see that uh, they, it corresponds to developing, since that says it has a limited capability to process or document TP information, meaning they have the capability, but poorly defined roles and responsibilities for processing, documenting TP information responsible over that, meaning that they did not clearly specify um, which, which persons are responsible for, um, for doing so. So you click again, and now you see it works. Uh, the developing turns into blue because this is your as is. Uh, but company A uh, would like to have a centralized and standardized, standardized documentation per large region. Now we see, go to the, uh, the next level, established, advanced, and leading. You see that in advanced, um, it says that the standardized capability to process slash document TP information uh, and uh, TP information processing and documentation activities are centralized and standardized by large regions. The difference between four and five, for example, is that four is per large region and five is global. So then once you have uh, set your desire to be status, you, also, you again click on um, on the arrow until you are set on your desired level, the orange one. So whenever you have done this for uh, for each workflow with all these five questions, so like Igna already says 45 questions, then you go to the next step, which shows an uh, aggregated uh, scorecard. It gives you three types of overviews of your as is and to be status, where again, as is uh, is blue and to be is orange. 
and it gives you a very clear spider web uh, to show where you are and where you want to be. So you need to fill the gaps in order to get to the orange line. And then this is a uh, global overview for all the um, workflows together. And then we also have an, a scorecard per workflow. So the the with the exact numbers and again with um, with a small small spider web that really shows your assets to be per question. Then I will go back to the the presentation again and give the word to to Igna. Thank you, Willemijn, for such a detailed explanation on how it actually looks and works in practice. And uh, uh, as illustrated by Willemijn, she illustrated a couple of questions. But if you get the answers to the remaining questions and then consolidate the results of those nine building blocks or, or 45 uh, questions, we get the spider web diagram, uh, a showcase by Willemijn as well, uh, which indicates the current and target uh, TP function uh, maturity uh, levels. Um, and, and this, uh, I believe, serves uh, as a particularly effective communication tool as it helps to explain the gaps to various stakeholders very easily by uh, taking them through the action steps and quick, uh, quickly assessing results. Uh, so as, uh, as Willemijn already mentioned, we apply this exercise to the uh, um, company operating in the financial services industry. And it resulted in the following insights, as you can see in the slide. Uh, so risk management, benchmarking, and sign-off processes um, are very poorly or not designed at all within the organization. And uh, so uh, if we elaborate a little bit more, there, are no clear, there is no clear definition of risk. Uh, there is a lack of coordination in drafting documentation, uh, legal agreements, and transpricing calculations uh, for financial reporting are not uh, going in, in, in the right way as well. On the benchmarking side, uh, it has uh, a lot of service providers, meaning that there is no clear strategy or criteria on how to select tax transfer pricing advisors. Also, it follows a chaotic uh, approach or process uh, in using external versus internal databases. And finally, there is no one within the whole organization who is granted the full responsibility, for example, signing transfer pricing documentation or, or tax transfer pricing policy papers. So, um, so when we have these type of results uh, of current and target maturity assessment, uh, the final step for us uh, is to create a transformation plan for, for closing these gaps. So for this purpose, let's move to the next slide. So under this step, uh, TPA defines an action plan uh, on how to close these gaps. Um, and, and then uh, a company or you together with the assistance of TPA can choose the activities most likely to provide quick wins uh, and immediately start moving uh, the TP pra practice or governance to a risk-focused role. And uh, in other words, depending on your um, uh, uh, appetite for change, uh, resources, targets, uh, complexity of the business, and all of, of course benefits expected, um, um, uh, you can together with TPA define an exact activity and a time planner for, for such, such an activity. And uh, if you once again focus on, on my example, on financial services company example, uh, we see that, uh, for instance, uh, to move risk management, so the first one uh, uh, illustrated in the, in, in the slide, risk management process, so to move uh, uh, this uh, practice from one to four, um, a company under review needs to explicitly define transfer pricing tax, tax risks. Uh, it needs to allocate accountabilities and responsibility profiles among relevant in-house tax and transfer pricing team members. Um, also, it, it, can, it can even go further uh, and, and apply best readiness tests uh, to further identify areas for improvement. Um, so now we can move to the final slide. Okay. And uh, Raymond, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I think the example that Digna showed and, and Willemijn showed you know, is obviously an example, and there is a long 
if you, if you look at the total web, there's quite a list of, uh, of, of, of topics to deal with, and especially if you see the as is versus the expected or the targeted, uh, there's a number of areas to work on, which means there's a lot of work to do. Um, in practice, we do see companies that are mature and have a lot of these pretty much well organized, others lesser. I think the world is changing extremely rapidly if we think about what BEPS, it was already mentioned, is trying to achieve. Um, we put transfer pricing a little bit at the heart of things, um, maybe not always very uh, uh, very accurately done, but on the other hand, if we think about BEPS, it's all about shifting income um, and base erosion. So it does reflect where the tax world is focusing on today and also given the shift in expectations that governments have, because it's actually the governments that are trying to shoot at you uh, through the BEPS program that is led by the OECD, the long list might not be that far from reality if you start to redefine the stakeholder goals that you need to achieve tomorrow. Yesterday's stakeholder goals you may be able to achieve, but tomorrow's, that's the big question uh, that you are best positioned in to, to answer. But if if we look at that and we take that into account and we take an as is uh, in this in this approach is what we try to help you with if possible. Uh, you're gonna have to jointly decide on what the to be status is and the gap and develop a plan. So we will take your stated goals and that's what Igna was talking about, and try to work with you to develop the transformation plan on how to achieve this. In principle, we will go back to the nine building blocks that we discussed before. We will look at them. We will have to break them down in each and every process. It's the same old story again. And we need to start allocating or reallocating roles and responsibilities to individuals, to departments, to make sure that you can actually deliver against those targets and that you have uh, an agreed plan around what you need to deliver, how to communicate and to whom to communicate this, which doubles back, if you will, to what we said at the beginning in how we defined the three areas in the triangle uh, that generate basically a good corporate governance around tax overall in your organization, which are the elements of goals, the controls, and the communication. And that comes back at the back end again, uh, as if it's almost like a vicious circle. So clearly, if you, if you think about what does it mean to be in control, what is your benefit, your risk management uh, is a bit clearer and you have much better Insight. It's about having information and making decisions, allowing you to take a better decision on the way forward, um, but also through that create the transparency that allows you to, to basically uh, share the relevant information needed by your stakeholders. So, if you will, the last sentence is, what is the potential benefit of it? It serves as a catalyst for efficiency in your organization and it serves as a basis for continuous development and improvement of your organization. Um, with that, I want to thank you for all of you listening and not dropping off because you're bored about how we present our stuff. Um, what we would love to do, subject to your need of more information, I want to open the floor for all of you, if you have any questions, to raise your questions by uh, typing them into the chat box on your screen, and we will try to answer those questions as they come in. So I see a, a question coming in. Um, the question is, uh, who in the company is going to to fill in the, the uh, Excel assessment? Ikna, maybe you want to answer that? Ikna, did you get the question? Yeah, can you please repeat it? Uh, so we got a question, uh, who in the company should, let's say, uh, fill in the the um, assessment, so the as is and to be status? 
Um, the, the target audience for this type of assessment is, of course, uh, tech enterprising people within the organization. And, of course, uh, it can be organized in, in, in uh, uh, two different ways. Of course, it can be done internally, first of all, within our organization, and, uh, and uh, also together with, uh, with TPA. So we, we, we assist and help and explain uh, what, what each uh, level means uh, for that particular uh, organization. So, Raymond, do you have uh, anything to add? No, I think it's also a conversation between us and, uh, and, 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 and yourself, the, the, the client, so to speak, because it's a, um, you know, you need to understand first and foremost what does the company itself want and what are its goals. And if the goals are, are wide and the stakeholder group is wide, you may want to involve some of those stakeholders, so people outside of the tax department in the questionnaire, especially if you're talking about the status to be, uh, because that is quite relevant to make sure that you have the information of what is actually expected of you as a department to deliver to also get the view of those people. So I think that's uh, that's uh, that's a relevant factor. But I think it's a it's a conversation that needs to take place between yourselves and 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 us if this is where you want to go. Yes, I, I completely agree. That's correct. So we got another question uh, regarding the TP governance maturity assessment. Someone is asking if the questions from the assessments are defined uh, for each case or they are uh, the same for all the cases. Um, I will. I can answer that for myself. Uh, yes, first step, a pair of workflow. We have uh, five step workflows, and each step, uh, step workflow has a question that is different for, for every step, uh, step workflow. So uh, um, we have 45 different questions. But I think the question in the way it is asked is, it is not yet company specific. It's a yes. generic list of questions which from our experience are applicable to many companies. Having said that at the same time, uh, needless to say, if your organization has very specific requirements, we can build that in into the questionnaire and make it more company specific. Uh, so I hope that that answers your question. So we have uh uh, another question: um, How long does it take to to do the assessment? So, for Igne, do you have a, an indication, Igne? Uh, it's uh, pretty much very in line with the, our uh, other initiative, that's readiness test. Uh, probably you are also aware of that. So, it it will take one or two weeks to to to, to do this exercise. Uh, but if, if, as I already mentioned, it depends on, on uh, how you prefer to organize it because uh, uh, if, if you would like to uh, just take the, uh, the, the questionnaire and just do it yourself to assess it so, uh, and, and we don't need to uh, jump in a lot, so it, it, it will be much, much quicker. But, uh, but of course, we can, it, it can be organized in, in, a, in other, other way as well where um, uh, we assist you in, in helping to, 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 to define the, the uh, as is and to be. Uh, level and um, uh, and yeah, so in total it it will take uh, one or two weeks. Thank you, Ekna. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from your end? I don't think there are any more questions coming through. So with that, I would like to thank you all, and I would like to close the session. Uh, thank you very much for your time and hope to uh, have you back on another webinar of TPA Global. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.